Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Wellby Show and Podcast. I am thrilled to have Dr. Casey Holland here today as my guest. She is a naturopathic physician and a wealth of knowledge on Epstein-Barr virus, also known as EBV, and mold and other you know, environmental toxin and stealth infection type uh, topics. So she is going to talk about Epstein-Barr virus and its connection to autoimmunity and symptoms that we are just now really starting to recognize. So it's really exciting to have her here today. Casey, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. We are thrilled to have. So first of all, Epstein-Barr virus is sort of a unique thing to be an expert on. (laughs) So can you share a bit about your story with um, us and talk about how you came to kind of specialize in this topic and and mold and, and things like that? Of course. Unfortunately, most of it started with personal experience, as does for a lot of people there, you know, specialty in an area, uh, but growing up, I was always um, seeing a naturopathic physician. My mom actually was told that she would never be able to have children. And then two months later, after seeing a naturopathic physician, um, it was in Oregon, Dr. Weiss, who was a pioneer for for natural health, if you know of him. Um, After seeing him for two months, she was pregnant with me. So we just always had naturopathic medicine. Um, Growing up, we moved from Oregon to Montana. And during that like move, um, I started to have GI symptoms, different things. Um, Looking back, you know, it's hard to say what what it was, but I kind of started to have a lot of GI health problems. They resolved um, with a naturopathic physician, but then, um, you know, I started going to a bigger school and in let's see, it was um, sixth grade, I developed really severe mono. Um, You know, I was calling my mom at school saying, can you come get me? I just don't feel good. But I didn't have any specific symptoms, really. It was just, I don't feel good. And at that age, I think, you know, they thought maybe I just didn't like the new school. Um, But a mono spot showed that I had mono and it, I was out of school for close to three months. And even afterwards, I just didn't recover. I I mean, I did a lot better with naturopathic medicine, but it became something that I didn't quite understand was still a problem, you know, because we still thought, okay, you had it once you had a bad case. It's taking longer, but I didn't realize how it would impact kind of the rest of my life and how I take care of my body and decisions that I need to make. Um, so for a while I would be fine. And then if there was stress or, um, I was an athlete, um, so I would do sports, around, around the year. And there'd be, you know, it'd be like, why, why is it so hard for me to recover? Or, or I was just different than, than my peers. Um, and so then fast forward, um, to college, I was playing volleyball and taking pre-med courses. I knew I wanted to be a naturopathic physician and it was just too much. You know, I don't, I'm sure that being in college and eating whatever I wanted and not taking care of my body also played a role, but I just completely crashed. I had to quit volleyball because physically I just wasn't keeping up with the team. And it was really, it was like, what, is, you know, what is going on? I feel like I have mono again, but doctors that I would go to would just do the mono spot they wouldn't even do like a full panel and they'd just be like, you know, it's just, you're just tired. It's just adrenal fatigue. And that kind of went off and on, you know, throughout all my college, I, I kind of was hard on myself. I was just like, okay, I just need to be more motivated. Like everybody feels this way. Um, I just need to suck it up. And that sure didn't help the problem. <laughs> and also I was away from home. So I wasn't seeing my naturopathic doctor. So I really only had, you know, more standard of care physicians available. So I'd go home and see him on the holidays and like feel better. And he would help me balance things. But then, you know, I was away from home and just in a different environment that continued in medical school. But then I started to really notice like patterns and, um, really think, okay, this is EBB. And then I started being the teaching clinic and I saw patients. It was like, they were just attracted to me. The universe does that that had the same symptoms. And I said, 
I'm going to run an EBV panel on you <laughs> and it would come back positive And that'd be the only thing. And I was like, okay, this is like the same thing. And then I finally like ran it on myself and was like, okay, this is not, you know, this is a real thing. And it really wasn't popular back then either because medical medium hadn't written his book. Nobody really talked about it um, as much as we are today, which is really cool that we're talking about it more today. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. Um, when I graduated naturopathic medical school, um, I was, had also been exposed to mold. And so then when I went into residency and I, I basically, the residency that I was in was awesome in a, in a way that we did a full viral panel on pretty much everybody that had fatigue. So I got to see so many labs and I started to say, okay, why is this person getting better? Why isn't this person? Um, and it gave me a lot of exposure there. And, and then, um, it just kind of kept divulging as I peeled back the layer of my health, other people's health. And then, um, when it really all came together, I just wanted more people to know, you know, that, that you can heal from EBV and also just even know what's going on with their health when it happens, because for so long, you know, I just thought, okay, I'm just tired. And I see that in people, especially women, um, a lot because we can look fine and we're really good at smiling and just looking fine, but we feel awful. And so that's when I really just started sharing and it's just grown from there. That's awesome. I want to ask one quick clarifying question before we go all the way back and talk about some of the basics yeah. of what EBV is, but you mentioned the difference between a mono spot and a, and a full EBV panel. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So a mono spot usually is just like a little, I mean, it can even just be a finger prick and they're just checking the IgM, which is the first antibody response to Epstein Barr virus. That is mono. The, technically mono is really just like the first time that you get Epstein Barr virus. And then a full panel is going to look at that IgM. It's called the viral capsid antigen IgM, but it's also going to look at your IgG titers, which are your soldier cells that come into fight later. Um, and then if you do it right, you can also look at an early antigen IgG or excuse me, early antigen and a nuclear antigen IgG. So we're looking at different pieces of the virus to better understand what the viral load is looking like. And the early antigen is typically what's positive for about three to six months during an reactivation. It's tricky because, you, you know, it only lasts for about six months, but if you can catch it in that window, then you can have that surefire, like, yes, there's a reactivation here. Got it. Okay. No, thank you so much for that explanation. We're going to talk about testing again um, a little later, but could you just simply explain what the virus is and what, you know, besides fatigue, kind of how it affects the human body and, and how common it is, you know, some statistics around how many people have it. Absolutely. It's really common. They estimate that over 95% of us are infected. Some say, you know, higher than that. So pretty much we all, we all get it. It's kind of, you know, just a normal, normal bug. Um, it's usually passed through saliva, um, but it can be passed through other bodily fluids as well. And most people get it, you know, as a child, some people don't get it until college. Sometimes it can be more severe that first time if you're older and you get it. We kind of break it up with, you know, the, the acute infection and then long-term infection. Um, so it is human herpes virus four. So it's from that viral family and that family of viruses has the property of going latent to lytic. So latent, it's not replicating. It's still in your cells, but it's not causing problems. And then if we go to a lytic where it's active, that's when we have the problem. So we think, you know, it's just like cold sores or things like that with the other herpes viruses you don't get them unless you're stressed because usually we keep it in a latent state or if there's something else going on with the immune system. Um, so it's considered an opportunistic infection, usually with an acute onset where it's the first time that you have it. it you might not even know that you had it because it can just be like a simple cold or flu. A lot of people are like, well, I never had mono. I'm like, well, you probably had it and it just got over it quickly and thought it was a cold or flu and never got tested for it. Um, 
And that presents, you know, it could be a sore throat, malaise, some swollen lymph nodes. Sometimes there's a rash. Oftentimes it can also present with strep at the same time. So some people will think they just have strep, didn't realize that they also had mono. And if it's a more severe case, we might notice a swollen tender spleen. Um, so like for me, it was like, hey, you can't do any contact sports, things like that right now with your spleen, you can't ride your horse um, and things like that if it's more severe, but it's pretty quick usually. Uh, in a reactivated or a chronic state where it's it's gone latent and then it's gone lytic again, or maybe you got it for the first time and your body never put it into a latent state, that's when things get really wild and we see all sorts of symptoms. I mean, on Facebook, it's like, hey, does this dot on my nose, is that from EVV? <laughs> um, but we can see gastrointestinal problems. We can see joint pain. We can see dizziness. We can see um, tinnitus ringing in the ears, a lot of more severe fatigue, malaise feeling. And sometimes I also see anxiety because of the cytokines that it turns on. So when EBV turns on, the problem is that it pushes on a lot of inflammatory pathways, which is why it's also associated with other diseases. So when that happens, depending on what else was going on in your life, what your gastrointestinal health was like, uh, we can see a big, big, wide range of symptoms. And that's why it can be tricky with for patients because they get, feel confused about, well, what is this actually causing? Is it something else? Um, and that's what we try to help support with as well as understanding kind of what symptoms it's actually causing. But the world of virology is ever developing as we've seen these past two and a half years. And so also, I just don't think I mean, we're learning new things. We'll talk about new things that we're learning with EBV, but I don't think we have a complete understanding also of how it really interacts with the body. Got it. I mean, I love, I love any guest on this show who says there's still a lot we don't know because I think, you know, a humble doctor is a good doctor by saying like, here's everything I know, but you know, what we don't know is way more than what we do know. And it's, that's just, you know, a, a fact of medical and scientific uh, understanding at, you know, this point in civilization, right? So you said something and I wanted to circle back to it. Um, other herpes viruses, as you mentioned, you know, one that might cause a cold sore, for example, right? That kind of uh, virus tends to always be in your body and your body can um, make it, I think you, the term was latent or deactivated, right? Um, and then in times of other viruses or health issues, you know, coming, coming forth in your body and or times of great stress, um, that virus can, you know, be activated again. And then that's why you might have a cold sore, right? Um, is EBV similar in that way? Once it's in your body and you make it latent, would, you know, a different, uh, maybe it's moving into a home with mold or a time of great stress or something cause it to be reactivated? Yes, that's correct. So once you have it, it's not going to, to leave your body. Got it. Okay. And just for clarification, and because it's, you know, very current, um, mm -hmm. COVID-19, I think is a different sort of virus in that your body, once your immune system kind of tackles it, um, it's not like a time of great stress three years from now would make it reactivated, correct? That's what we know so far but okay. I'm not right. going to, it's constantly <laughs> changing our understanding of COVID agree. Can it be easily reactivated? Like how frequently are people that have EBV having reactivated, having the virus reactivated? Like, is it, you know, as simple as like you got another cold, it would it be reactivated or it really has to be something pretty intense. You know, that really depends on the person. And that's why, so there are some you know, it's like some kiddos where it's like, they just struggle with it their whole life so much more than other people. And, and we have to look at the whole person. So for some people it's, it's, they never had it reactivate. And then it's mold exposure or something like that, which if you're exposed to mold, I mean, it's almost rare that it doesn't reactivate from what I have seen just with how, um, how that 
interacts with EBV and specifically, but the big thing that I look for for reactivation. So anytime I'm treating somebody with Epstein-Barr virus is I don't just kill the virus. I look at what caused it to reactivate. So in all the research that I've seen and everything, you know, there's all these studies on EBV, EBV reactivated because of this, because of that. And the most common thing that patients say is stress. I was stressed and then I got sick. So, so we know that, but there's other things, mold toxins, um, and they all have in common oxidative stress and oxidative stress is just an imbalance in the body between the way that we can handle reactive oxygenation species. And we create them naturally just daily by exposure to toxins, daily stress. It's part of how our body operates. If we don't have the antioxidants and the cellular metabolism to deal with that, then we have oxidative stress. And there's a transcription factor on EBV. And it seems that when oxidative stress is reaching a certain level in a body, that that's what triggers it is kind of how I explain it and pull it into what I've read and combine everything. So when we look at somebody, we don't know their oxidative stress levels because so many different things can cause it, right? Emotional stress, mental stress. Um, what if there was a trauma when they were born in their childbirth. Like we just don't, we just don't quite know why their body's reacting, reacting that way. Um, mycotoxins, mold, um, birth control can cause oxidative stress, standard American diet, so many things. So we have to consider the whole person and what all is in their toxin bucket and what has caused it to get to the point where there's enough oxidative stress that EBV is reactivating. So that was a really long answer. <laughs> um, but basically for some people, they really struggle with it and we ha really have to figure out the underlying things. Other people, maybe it just reactivates acutely after they had a family tragedy or, or whatnot. And then it goes back to normal and they're fine. Um, so it really depends on the person, their history, and, and what they have going on in their lifestyle. Got it. MS and other autoimmune diseases have been very linked to EBV. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know, there were two different, very fascinating studies that uh, the results of which came out somewhat recently, in the last couple of months, um, showing that there's a connection between multiple sclerosis, also known as MS, um, and activated EBV. EBV and a different study that showed that people that had an immune cell transplant that had MS in which they were then able to have their EBV deactivated, the progression of the MS or progression of that disease stopped. So both studies to me show a very strong connection there <laughs> um, between that virus and that autoimmune condition. But I would assume it's related to all autoimmune conditions in some way. So um, can you unpack some of this recent research and tell us, you know, like how it might change conventional clinical treatment of MS or is it already changing uh, treatment of MS? Yeah, well, you, I mean, you make a good point. We've known for a long time that viruses affect or can activate autoimmune conditions. And this is because of the pathways that they impact. So there's a couple of things that EBV does that's unique um, when it comes to, so once it reactivates, it kind of causes a snowball effect because it decreases the body's own capabilities of clearing out reactive oxygenation species. And then it also increases the virus itself being reactivated, creates more oxidative stress. So it kind of is this snowball and then it's, you know, depending on how long you've had it, it can be harder to get it under control. And when it's doing that, um, it affects the NF-kappa B pathways, which are associated with a lot of autoimmune conditions and cancer. Um, and the jak stat pathway is really associated with cancer. So these are pathways that affect how our cells develop and proliferate, and EBV causes them to operate in a way that they weren't supposed to, which is why it's more associated with these autoimmune conditions. Um, the problem is that sometimes, like if you look in the research, it's like, oh, EBV and lupus, EBV and rheumatoid arthritis, it's all there. So then we get into this bubble of EBV causes all autoimmune conditions. And it's like, no, 
what caused the oxidative stress that ticked off EBV that then really started a fire. So yes, we have to deal with the EBV, but we have to deal with the other things. MS is interesting because it actually, we are seeing has a direct relationship with EBV through the neurofilament light chain. And that was specific to the Epstein-Barr virus. Like I believe the study checked other viral families too, and it it wasn't the same. So it does seem to be that Epstein-Barr virus has a more direct relationship there. This changes things because before it was kind of like, well, all viruses could do this. And we didn't have a, a direct relationship there. I think that this puts a lot of emphasis on actually dealing with the infection and, um, looking at it as something that we need to be more aggressive about because a lot of times it was just the, well, clean up your diet and lifestyle or just rest and, and let it take its course. But I don't think that we should just let it take its course. I don't think patients can agree with that. Um, so I think that this will put a lot of emphasis on dealing with EBV. One emphasis that that is going to be is vaccine research and a vaccine for Epstein-Barr virus, given that it affects so many people and is now directly with this, we're seeing, we're going to see a lot of research money going towards a vaccine for it. Got it. And do you think that's kind of the only, you know, standard of care clinical change we'll see, or will there be others? Well, I hope not. I think that I know that I have been working um, with conventional doctors and in using different like valcyclovir, which is for other human terpy famous family viruses is typically used and it's not typically used for EBV, but we do use it and see results. Um, you know, I had a patient the other day, she felt better after three days on it. So I think we might see that used more frequently. And for patients, you know, we, when we have a patient, there's always natural options, but sometimes to really hit EBV hard, we might need like IV vitamin C and a lot of supplements, which could be really expensive. And so a prescription for valacyclovir might be a lot more readily available and affordable for them, especially if we can get it covered by insurance. So I very much hope that running a complete EBV panel is easily covered by insurance and that an antiviral treatment for that is easily covered by insurance. That is my hope, but I have no idea if that will transpire or not. And you're saying that because that's not really the case now, right? So a full EBV panel would not be paid for by insurance now, generally. I mean, it depends on your doctor, what coverage you have and also how they code it. But most doctors, because, you know, they can get audited too, they usually wouldn't prescribe for that because it's not standard of care to prescribe that for that. It's not standard of care to order that for that. Um, so then, you know, yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So now I want to ask just a lot of questions since I know you have a lot of information on this on healing, you know, from yeah. putting this virus into a deactivated state for people that have it as an activated state. And is it different if you're also suffering from something else like COVID or Lyme or, you know, still have a high mold or mycotoxin level in your body versus like just activated EBV? Like what, what do you think are the most successful things you've seen or done with your patients on to, to heal? Yeah, I would say that if you're living in mold and you're exposed or you have left mold, but you didn't properly clean your items and might have taken mold with you, or you haven't healed and cleared the mycotoxins from your gut and your sinuses, even if you don't have sinus congestion, that a lot of times if you've had a past positive EBV panel, I don't even want to retest because there, you're, it's still going to be there. Um, EBV and mold, mold causes a ton of oxidative stress on the body. So it's going to turn it on, but then it also, I learned from Dr. Krista impacts your B cell memory. And we know that those are some of the main, I mean, that was EBV's original claim to fame was causing Burkitt's lymphoma, the first human tumor virus. Um, and so 
if your B cells can't remember that it's seen it, how is it going to put it into latent state? So if mold is there, we have to deal with it. Another thing that I have seen be a huge, huge thing is parasites. Um, if we have parasites and we don't deal with it, I, I mean, I have seen people after we get rid of parasites, they just say, I feel better than I have in 10 years. My EBV is like non-existent. Um, so, so those are two things that are really big. Uh, the other one is trauma. So our autonomic nervous system, I just got back from a training on neural therapy with Dr. Klinghart, like in person, amazing, but it just really opened my eyes again to how complex our autonomic nervous system is. And so if we have a trauma, if you have a scar, ladies, if you've had a hysterectomy and it was traumatic, which I don't know how it couldn't be unless, you know, you just were in a very good space and were aware and did all the meditation and, and all the work that goes into that, but it is a shock to your system, hormones and emotionally. Um, and that trauma can be held in scars. Um, and so I don't really have time to get into it, but neural therapy can help with resetting that different areas of the autonomic nervous system so that we're no longer in a sympathetic state. And so if you are in a sympathetic state, if you're in a toxic relationship, if you are still dealing with trauma, um, and for anybody who doesn't know what that means, a sympathetic state doesn't mean sympathy. <laughs> it means oh, yeah. <laughs> acute, acute stress sort of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of us think, don't even realize that we're in it. Um, it's just a part of how society is, you know, you get that text message. You're just constantly in this fight or flight state where you're ready to defend yourself. You're ready to run. And when you're, when you're in that state, it's the same as if a grizzly bear is chasing you. So when a grizzly bear is chasing you, you are not going to be creating hormones. You're not going to have your immune system working. You're not going to be digesting. You're going to be ready to run, ready to get away. And if you're in that state still, it's really hard to heal from. Um, another thing that I see a lot, I mean, if, if Lyme is there, of course, um, we need to deal with that, but I see Lyme be a bigger problem and EBV be a bigger problem post-concussion, uh, post-car accident. And we see the same thing post-COVID. So post-COVID syndrome is actually very similar to also having a concussion, physical concussion to the way that it impacts your blood brain barrier. Um, so there's so many things that go into that. Another big thing is glyphosate. Um, that Which, think, for anybody who's not familiar yeah. with what that it's roundup the chemical uh, pesticide yeah we've been inundated with it in our food and when i check levels more often than not they're elevated with people with epstein bar virus and it i mean glyphosate is associated with lymphoma ebv is associated with lymphoma, when you start to really scale out and look at these things, they're impacting similar pathways. And so that needs to be addressed as well. So yeah, those are kind of the big things that I see make us not able to overcome Epstein-Barr virus. Got it. Um, and what overall do you see? I mean, I know it's highly complex because it also depends on what else you're dealing with. And you just listed a lot of the things as far as concussion, mm -hmm. trauma, Lyme, uh, mold, but what do you see overall as the most effective treatments for deactivating EBD? Are they mostly herbal or, you know, what's kind of the range of things? Yeah. So anytime I start treatment with a patient, I like to use the therapeutic order, which is a core part of naturopathic medicine, where we start at the foundations with the least invasive tool all the way up to the most invasive. So think of like the least invasive tool is breathing and breathing properly. Um, and the most invasive tool would be like surgery or something. Um, so foundationally, we usually get rid of gluten. Um, even if you're not celiac, it's just has such a higher content of glyphosate and it can still cause irritation to your gastrointestinal tract, um, processed sugar, processed sugar does this to your blood sugar, um, your body, when you crash, you feel like you're starving. Your body is then stressed. We don't want that stress. So, you know, just foundational things, I would say remove gluten, remove sugar. Um, 
reduce stress. We start at that baseline because if those things aren't done, then even if we're doing higher interventions, they might not work. Um, there are a ton of herbs that are helpful. Um, it depends on what you have going on with your body. For example, if you have blood pressure issues, we don't want to use licorice. If you have Hashimoto's, we might not want to use lemon balm. Um, so there's a lot of different options there. Usually I use a blend of herbs. Um, a lot of our blends have echinacea in them. And sometimes I don't quite like using echinacea for long periods of time with chronic Epstein-Barr virus, because again, echinacea is revving up the immune system a lot. We don't want to push you towards an autoimmune state where everything is reacting a lot. So one herb that I really like is astragalus. Um, it has a tonifying nature. It supports your natural killer cells, which are responsible for going after viruses. And it supports your nervous system as well as being antiviral. So I like things like that that have multiple modalities when it comes to herbs. Um, there's a lot of options there. We want your vitamin D levels to be optimal. Um, the biggest thing that, you know, if we're doing natural higher um, therapeutics would be IV vitamin C. We have actual, uh, there's an actual study, I have it right here, where we see antibodies go down with IV vitamin C. And so that if somebody wants to be natural, but we are at a point where we, you know, we've dealt with whatever toxins were there, we've got foundations on board, we've been doing supportive herbs, and we're ready to really do a big killing stage. A lot of times I don't start with killing because it might make you feel awful. Um, yeah. I have, uh, I work with some people as private clients, as a holistic patient advocate. Mm -hmm. I have my board certification in that. And essentially it's like a, you know, health coach, lawyer, investigator, personal assistant, mm -hmm. like coach, all of the things together, navigating somebody through a, a chronic disease discovery phase and then healing. And what I often encounter, especially since a lot of people with Lyme come to me, um, is that they want to start the killing phase right away. They, the, the idea that there's a foreign thing that's kind of controlling their body and, and causing them to feel terrible all the time is just awful. They just want it out. It's like a burglar in your house. You know, just get them out. Right. Um, and just also like a hatred of them because they associate them with causing all these problems and they want the bugs to be dead. Um, and I have to really emphasize, because uh, I've interviewed a lot of people like you who have said the same thing, which is that you, when you go to the killing phase right away, you're not only going to feel terrible because there's like a nuclear war happening inside your body, but also if you don't have the foundations that you just spoke of set up, those bugs will be obliterated through the battle, but will rise up again because the foundation isn't there for the good guys to be in control. And so it takes patience, but you have to wait to do the killing phase. A lot of people are like, no, I just, let's go, you know? And um, anyway, when you said that, I was like, oh, this is something I, I deal with a lot. Yeah, exactly. You are completely correct. And, and that is such amazing work. Uh, but yeah, if we're, if we're at that phase and we are with somebody that we can be aggressive with or in a more acute setting, um, we might use IV vitamin C or valacyclovir. And then I also, just for clarity is an antiviral drug. Is that the case? Yeah, okay. It's usually used for, um, you know, like cold sores, HSV1, HSV2. Um, and then I always have antioxidants on board. Curcumin actually inhibits EBV nuclear antigen one. It also sub calms down that NF kappa B pathway that EBV activates. Um, and it increases the activity of our own, of our own antioxidants and decreases that snowball effect that happens with Epstein-Barr virus. So that's one that I always have on board. Um, and if we're having a lot of, you know, brain fog, I may have resveratrol on board. Um, my, it, you know, if there's mold and other things, then we might need glutathione and um, other antioxidants on board too. But usually I'm always supporting with a lot of antioxidants. And then we have to just address things as they come up. So if we have dysbiotic bacteria in our gut or leaky gut, we have to deal with that. If we have thyroid problems, you know, we might need to 
give thyroid medication while we're going through this so that your th- you need your thyroid operating well to heal. Um, so there's nothing heroic about being like, I'm just not going to take my thyroid medication. You might need it. You, you need the right kind and it's working for you. And we need to support your other systems. For example, if you have thyroid issues, we should always be supporting your adrenals. But if you need the thyroid medication, we, we want to take it during that time so that we can have your immune system working together. So it really becomes an art. The more I see, the more I'm like, it's an art. Um, and then there's fun things that we can do like flower essences, neural therapy, guided imagery to help release trauma and things that may be keeping us in that state. And that is highly, highly individualized for, for each person and their journey. So you mentioned earlier um, the medical medium and Mm -hmm. how he has been talking about the presence of activated Epstein-Barr virus and autoimmunity or just chronic disease in general for a long time. And I think way before, you know, the, the research was there. Of course, he's most famous for his celery juice would you call it just celery juice cleanse or celery juice treatment or something like that? It's basically, you know, just drinking celery juice on an empty stomach in the morning every day. Is that something you think is really important in healing activated EBD or is that just, you know, is celery juice just an example of, you know, a very alkaline, healthy vegetable and, you know, having more of them? Yeah, you know, I appreciate the awareness that medical medium has brought about to Epstein-Barr virus. I don't quite think it's all encompassing because I do think there's a tone that, well, EBV causes all these problems and it's just EBV. Um, And my concern is that I have so many patients come to me that have done his, that they have gone pretty much plant-based and then they're eating a lot of fruit as well. And the problem that I see happen sometimes is so celery juice is great, right? I mean, it it's, it's like, yes, if you add more vegetables into your diet and you were never eating vegetables, then you're probably going to feel better and your body needs it. Uh, but if we overdo that, or if you have mycotoxins or you have candida or you have an oxalate imbalance for another reason, and you're doing all of a sudden all this celery juice and not having other nutrients that you need people get kidney stones, people get high oxalates, they don't feel good. Um, the other problem is that it, it, depending on what's going on, I really do still think that meat is important. Um, obviously some people are vegan for their beliefs or for specific reasons, but all in all, I think that we're meant to have a well-rounded whole foods diet and that your body needs meat, your adrenals need meat, your cells need meat. And so a lot of this completely plant-based, especially with the fruit, a lot of times I see people and they're having sugar cravings and they're eating all this fruit. Well, I just had fruit. Yeah, but it's causing candida overgrowth. And if you're living in mold, then it's just, you feel awful. Um, so I've had- a lot of people don't realize that I had to explain this to somebody the other day. The CDC, not that we should use them as any sort of, uh, you know, holy grail of information, but just as a reference, um, I think they only advise like one and a half cups a day of fruit for women and two cups a day for men. And I think it's like two cups minimum of vegetables and, you know, three for men. Well, I think a lot of people, simply because it's sweeter and therefore tastier, um, will have that ratio the other way around. They're eating more than they need as far as fruit and a number of cups of fruit a day and and not nearly enough vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, And they forget that sugar is still sugar. Like obviously fruit sugar is much better because it also comes with vitamins and minerals and fiber and things Mm -hmm. like that. Um, But, and and it's not refined and therefore going to cause inflammation, but at some level of sugar, you know, your body does not do well with that in as far as, you know, grams per day. And so someone who's having a ton of fruit in their smoothie in the morning and then a fruit for a snack, and then also after dinner or as a snack in the afternoon, like they could be having way too much sugar and not realizing it because they think it's, oh, it's just plants, like whatever, it's it's all good for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And certainly for cancer, we know, and, and cancer clients that I've had, you know, they're naturopathic oncologists 
get them almost entirely off fruit, um, maybe just some very low sugar fruits like berries and things. So fruit is an interesting, I would never want to say like, you know, don't eat it, but, but it, people don't seem to realize there's a strong distinction between vegetables and fruit as far as how much is, is optimal. Yeah. Overall, when it comes to this, I have just gone on what I see in, in real, in real time. And I have had patients come to me because they have gotten a lot worse after going on a strict diet like that. And I think that a diet is something that also needs to be highly individualized. And, um, anytime there's a claim that this one thing works for everybody, I just don't see that happen or that play out. Everything I do is really individualized. And it's when we actually give somebody according to their body that we see improvement. But I mean, if you haven't been eating vegetables your entire life and you've been on a standard American diet, and then you start adding celery juice in, of course, you're going to feel better. Um, and so I'm not against celery juice. I'm not against vegetables. I'm not against soft fruit, but it just has to be done properly and look at looking at what is going on in your body. For example, somebody with mast cell activation syndrome might not do, might need some time away from the plant-based. They might need more meat-based and cooked vegetables to calm down histamine. So we have a lot of variety and it needs to be also diets change. What you needed six months ago is different than what you need now because we've made changes. Um, so we don't want to get too locked into to anything. And I think just basic variety and diet is also something that's really important because that's what impacts our flora in our gut. Right. Yes. I have a great interview all about the need for diversity because each of your good bacteria in your gut eat different things. And okay. so if you're just eating certain healthy things, but over and over and over like celery juice or anything else, you're feeding maybe some kinds or one kind of the flora that you need. But what about all the other ones that eat, you know, potatoes and uh, artichokes and these other things. So yeah, I mean, just variety being the spice of life is very true for, for gut health, for sure. And obviously your health and your ability to heal is only as strong as your gut health is, right? Um, being so connected to your immune system. So I would agree with you based on everything I have learned on the topic as well. So, okay, you've spoken about a lot of great treatments and I think um, for deactivating EBV. Um, is your way of, you know, test retesting that or your understanding of how long that takes. Um, obviously it's very individual and again, has a lot to do with what else is going on. But if you started working with somebody on trying to deactivate their EBV, on average, how long do you think that takes? And do you retest by just doing that EBV panel again and kind of seeing where the viral load is and, and all of that? So oftentimes what we see in the blood work doesn't match the patient's symptoms. So a lot of times people will start feeling better, but if we retest immediately, their labs look exactly the same, or sometimes their titers might even go up a little bit because their immune system is actually responding more to the EBV. So it can be really confusing. This is one part of virology that I don't think we fully have a handle on yet, but usually is what I do is after the patient starts feeling better, I wait three months and then I retest and we see sometimes it's better. Sometimes things look kind of the same. And when they look kind of the same, I say, yeah, but you feel better. And sometimes the body has a different way. You know, we just don't quite understand why the labs don't always match patient symptoms. Um, but the labs sometimes don't necessarily change even six months later. Sometimes it's a year later. Uh, so at that point, we just really go based on how the patient is feeling. We look at other labs, like how's their thyroid? Did their reverse T3 come down? Um, is their CRP now under control? Things like that. So that is just for anybody that doesn't know CRP is, um, an inflammation marker, right? So if that's, um, elevated, uh, then that means that they have like just sort of chronic inflammation in their body, um, which obviously you would want to get down. Awesome. Well, all of that is super helpful and also good to hear and reconfirm to me that, you know, chronic health issues, they take time because mm -hmm. every meal, every thought you have, every, you know, all of that is, is the healing and the body, you know, takes 
just the same way it's easy to gain weight and, and hard to lose it. Like it's easier to get sick than it, than it is to, to heal. And so your body really has to peel back the onion, all the layers of these issues, the trauma, the, the other, you know, maybe it's mold, mycotoxin type stuff, how much glyphosate has been in your food, all of that, um, slowly but surely digging itself out of the trenches. And so commonly that's a minimum of six months or, you know, like you said, even a year and really sticking with it. And it's very hard in our current culture and society, I think, to have that kind of patience and, you know, no, even in the back of your mind, somebody says, there's no way you're going to feel better until at least six months of doing what I'm telling you to do consistently, as far as diet and, and breath and taking herbs and supplements they might still say it's not working at three months because they just, you know, convince themselves of that. And we're also uh, programmed to be fatalistic and, and have negative beliefs about everything. Um, so it's really refreshing to hear somebody say, yeah, it's going to, it's going to take a while. And um, it's not even, there's no point to even hope or think that, you know, two months of doing something consistently should, should be all that it takes. So mm -hmm. healing and living in a healing way is really just a whole lifestyle change. It's kind of for a lot of people a wake up and I've seen this with cancer clients and just cancer stories. Um, it's a wake up that you're sort of living in disharmony and that you know returning to the earth, returning to healing type practices are just also practices that help with a great life. Calming down that autonomic nervous system, like eating food that you cook at home, well-rounded, balanced, whole foods, organic diet, like all of that. Um, and so, you know, the people that I think accept that and get that are happier too, because then it's just like, you know what, this is a different way I'm going to be living ongoing instead of just like, I have to do this whole 30 thing for 30 days to feel better. And then I can go back to like, however I was doing it before. So yeah, that's, that's what I've seen. And I'm, it's glad to hear you confirm that. So those were most of my questions about EBV and certainly autoimmunity, but I think the same applies for long COVID. It seems like um, they're seeing this link between EBV and long COVID. And I would assume, but correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of the things you already mentioned about how, you know, herbs and practices and supplements and dietary change that, that work to deactivate it also work to deactivate it with long COVID? Yeah, I will say that long COVID is unique and it really does kind of just unveil whatever, whatever you might not have known you had and it's, it's magnified. Um, mycotoxins and mold is a really big thing with it. And like I said, it really does impact the blood brain barrier. Um, I will say that in long COVID, um, it makes sense. Like, of course, EBV reactivated because we just dumped your body with oxidative stress and, and just the stress of COVID itself. And it's another viral infection. So it makes sense that EBV reactivated, but yes, EBV is also causing problems. I will say that in a lot of my long COVID patients that the antiparasitic that has been very much misunderstood that I won't say because I don't want to trigger um, anything that it is beneficial in a lot of people and that it has multiple actions. You know, it's been used for a very long time. It's the one that starts with an I. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very anti-inflammatory. And so for a lot of people that has been a tool that I would say shortens the amount of time that it would take for us normally. Um, IV vitamin C also has been really beneficial and the things that we talked about and with long COVID, the really important thing is it's kind of like whack-a-mole. It's like, oh, thyroid's off, hormones off, gut too. Like, it's just, we have to deal with everything. And that's why, unfortunately, in the conventional medical system, a lot of people are left really struggling because they get sent to endocrinology and endocrinology takes two weeks to switch their thyroid medication. And then we haven't even talked about, you know, the other infections or they aren't even aware of mold illness. Um, and so it really is taking a very holistic approach with long COVID and being aggressive. Um, there are people that are severely impacted by long COVID 
a lot of them didn't know that they were exposed to mold because their body was handling it fine and they get COVID and, you know, their, their oxygen's low. So we have to be as holistic, systemic, and aggressive as possible to make that recovery happen in a timely manner is what my experience has been with long COVID and Epstein-Barr virus. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Casey. This has just been so informative. You clearly are so knowledgeable about um, not only what's really going on when people have activated EDD, as far as all the other things below the surface they may not have known about, but also, you know, great ways to treat it, to, to deactivate it and to keep people in good health um, so that it doesn't, you know, continue to be reactivated. And obviously mentioned the, the therapeutic order, which is the foundation of naturopathic medicine, but, you know, using the foundations and all the way up to maybe needing an antiparasitic drug or antiviral mm-hmm. drug, I would assume you really only use the drug component of the treatment or, or use drugs in general when you feel like you've exhausted the kind of natural ways to kill viruses and you need to go there? Or do you feel like that's something you would use a lot for EDD? It depends. Whatever is going to get us back to the body's innate state most quickly. And for some patients, the, that is a pharmaceutical is what it would be. Pharmaceuticals aren't all bad. Problem is that oftentimes we use them chronically and we use them, but we don't take care of the underlying things. So I might use a pharmaceutical right away to get the person feeling better so that they can take a walk, you know, but we would also be doing other things underneath and looking at why it reactivated in the first place. Um, So yeah, it just depends on whatever is going to get the patient active and back to their innate state the fastest. Got it. Okay, great. Well, um, that's really interesting to know. And uh, we appreciate everything that you've shared. Is there anything else related to Epstein-Barr virus that you really think is important for the Wellbe Show audience to know that we haven't talked about already? I think the only thing that I kind of left out when we were talking about things that cause reactivation and foundations um, is EMFs and you know, turn your Wi-Fi off at night um, and be aware of conscious of how often your, you know, your cell phone is right next to you, put it in airplane mode. That really does play into this and causing oxidative stress. And I see people sometimes have setbacks because of that. And I, and it's a whole, I mean, you can spend a lot of time talking about EMS, but definitely have that on the radar as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have an aunt who's had different chronic health issues and she recently realized that she had EMF sensitivity Mm. and how much it was really affecting her. I mean, physically tingling and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually sent her into anaphylactic shock, uh, at some point, it was just a wild series of events and, um, you know, sort of how that happens to people I know is connected to some heavy metal stuff sometimes or, or other reasons, but it's just a whole fascinating uh, topic that I think is only just, it, it's been seen as fringe and conspiracy theory until you realize that like many official organizations have recommendations and guidelines about limiting your EMF exposure. So if they have that, they're aware that we're being inundated and it's no small thing. So we really all should be, uh, you know, paying attention to those guidelines and doing what we can. Um, it, it doesn't make you a conspiracy theorist to uh, follow official guidelines from like the state of California, for example, about uh, limiting that. I remember when I was pregnant, I couldn't believe how many official recommendations were out there as far as limiting your exposure to cell phones and things like that as a pregnant woman. And I always think anything that they say pregnant women should do is really what all people should be doing. Because mm-hmm. if it's going to harm a fetus, there's probably a good chance it's also harming you, even if it's just little by little or in a small way. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's great that you brought that up. That's definitely something that plays a role. And I think more and more understanding and research is going to come out over the next decade in which people will have to make really different decisions about how they, you know, wake up in the morning, for example, with their alarm or go to bed scrolling through Instagram or, uh, you know, even just, we all now use CarPlay, right. And, um, 
Google Maps and one of the official recommendations about pregnant women and and phones and EMFs was to not have your phone in use when you're driving. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, if you're using the maps, your phone's in use the whole time. So how are we going to deal with that? You know, it's now becoming pretty standard. Uh, So Mm -hmm. there's just all these things that I'm realizing we're doing without understanding the health impact. And it's going to come out more and more and we're going to have to change the way we do things. But anyway, thank you so much again. You were such a wonderful guest. And um, I love this topic because I think so many people don't realize that EBV is connected to something else that they're struggling with, whether it's autoimmunity or long COVID or chronic Lyme or whatever else. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's also more hopeful than I think just the, we don't know what's wrong with you, kind of stealth infection, mysterious whatever, it's like, we can identify it. Like you talked Mm -hmm. about with an EBV panel and actually know which herbs are helpful for it and what other treatments are helpful directly for that virus versus just really, you know, I think most MS patients have been just told it's genetic, right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that gives them something tangible to try to, you know, work on to get better. So Dr. Casey, thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Where else can people find you if they want to know more about your work? Yeah, thank you for having me, Adrian. Uh, you can find me at www.drcaseyholland.com. I'm also pretty active on Instagram, although a little less these days for the very reasons that Adrian just just spoke of. <laughs> you and me both. You and me both. <laughs> um, but those are the best ways to find me. And yeah, thanks again for having me. You're so welcome. Okay. Bye. Bye.